And uh, while they're making their way out, God has been good. One of the comments that uh, was posted on social media under one, one of the posts that I wrote, I think it was yesterday, uh, Leisha actually uh, wrote that, you know, she's talked with people who have, uh, you know, said that I've counseled with them or been there. And, and honestly, I could probably go through just about every row in here, and there's at least one, probably many, where we've been through stuff together. Uh, you know, there's a family issue, or maybe you were in the hospital, or you had something going on, you came in, and we talked about it, or any number of things, and we have been through a lot. In six years, we've built some pretty strong relationships, and so even though, you know, I'm not someone who uh, readily expresses affection except with Kim, but, uh, you know, the hug thing, and, and also the, the tears, uh, even though there are no tears, I tell you that this is tough because y'all are very, very special, and we love y'all, and uh, it has been wonderful, wonderful spending the last six years with you. Uh, one of the things that has, one of the a couple of the many things that have been such a joy to me is the fact that uh, we, we've had some people praying. I don't know if you know this, but on Thursday, there's always a group that shows up on Thursday to pray here in the sanctuary. Uh, that's been going on for at least a couple, three years maybe. Uh, and I don't know if you know this, but there's also some ladies that show up back there in the, in the cry room, in the, in the, the room back there, uh, before each Sunday morning service to pray. And so if there's been anything good that has happened, it's been because we have had people here that have committed to calling upon the name of God, to calling upon Him in prayer, and that's been so wonderful. But y'all have also been a blessing to me. One of the areas that at least I enjoy, whether or not I'm good at it is still, the, the jury is still out, but I at least enjoy it as I love studying, I love preaching, I love teaching, I love writing. And one of the things that y'all have done, many of you have done, is through cards or through words of affirmation have, uh, over the course of the last six years, talked about how that you have enjoyed it, you know, how God has spoken to you through the preached or taught word, and how that, uh, you know, there have been some things that have been made clearer to you as a result of that. And I'm telling you, if I was a cook, and every time I cooked a meal and I came out, you were telling me that you enjoyed my food, that'd make me want to get back in the kitchen. And uh, your comments make me want to get back in the study and, and uh, get into God's Word so that I can share some more. So thank you all very much. As uh, we come to this final Sunday, I was thinking, okay, how do I end this? What's the last sermon? What's the last sermon? And uh, what, what I thought is, you know, as we have been going through the book of 2 Timothy, essentially, 2 Timothy has a weight to it because Tim, uh, Paul knows that he's about to die. Paul knows that he is about to be martyred for the faith. And so every word that he says is measured. Every word that he says is intentional because he knows he's about to die. He wants to get the right things out to Timothy. He wants to make his words count. So I thought, you know, as, as I'm about to not die, hopefully not yet, but as I'm about to leave, I uh, thought, what, what is it that, that is the most important to my heart? What truth resonates with me that I want to get out? And, and it's this whole concept. It may sound weird at the beginning, but this is a truth that resonates in my heart. It's what keeps me going. It's the way that I see my relationship with the Lord. I've even spoken on this with you before, but I have titled the sermon this morning, Called to be Jesus' Slaves. Called to be Slaves of Jesus, and I'm bringing it out of 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19 and 20. So if you've got your Bibles, open them up to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19 and 20. I want to share with you what I believe to be one of the most incredible, liberating truths that are that's found in Scripture that can bless your heart if you truly understand it. Called to be slaves of Jesus. And honestly, whenever I say slave, we think negative, and rightfully so. Uh, if you're familiar, well, you are familiar with the uh, song Amazing Grace. Uh, John Newton, who wrote that song, wrote the song about Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound, that God would love me, that he would forgive me. John Newton was overwhelmed with the notion that God could love him and forgive him because of what he, John Newton, had been. He had been, he had owned a slave ship, and there had been much debauchery, much carnage, much 
debasing of human value that had been able to take place because he was a transporter of slaves. God saved him, and then he worked with William Wilberforce to abolish the slave trade in England. Slavery is ugly. Then in our own history, we understand that slavery was a part of our own history, and we look back on that with a distaste in our mouth as well. Slavery, the fact that people were owned by others, is distasteful. Not only that they were owned, but they were abused, they were mistreated, they were looked down on, they were beaten, they were killed, treated as property, no more than property. Rightfully so, when we think of the word slave, we think negative, rightfully so. Also, whenever we look at the New Testament, if we're familiar with the New Testament led by the Roman Empire, that, that period, the first century, we have been uh, made aware of the fact that if you were to walk down an average street of a Roman city, you, the, about one out of every three people would be a slave. They were owned by someone else. You may not be able to tell slavery was a little bit different there at that time. It was certainly not what it was here in the United States uh, whenever we look back to pre-Civil War, but it was still slavery. Someone was owned by another human, another human. And when we look at that, we think negative. And in fact, the, uh, the letter that Paul wrote to Philemon, honestly, it's a wonderful letter. If, you've, if you ever just want to read a book with one chapter that's got a, a, a wonderful uh, I mean, it's just fascinating. I've taught through the book of Philemon before. What Paul is doing in the book of Philemon is he is twisting, verbally twisting, a slave owner's arms to coerce him to let his slave go free. Slavery was bad. And in fact, it's really bad when we look at a Christian worldview, when we realize that when we look at Genesis chapter 1, we hear God saying, let us, the Trinity, make man in our image after our likeness. Slavery debases humanity. The word of Scripture elevates humanity. Why? Because you, my friend, are made in the image of God. That's why we as Christians celebrate life from the womb to the tomb because everyone has intrinsic value because they are created in the image of God. But not only that, we go to Genesis chap John chapter 15, verse 15, and Jesus looks at his disciples and says, I no longer call you slaves, but I call you friends. I call you friends. I'm welcoming you into relationship with me. I call you friends. Don't call you slaves anymore. I call you friends. And yet, even though Jesus said, I no longer call you slave, I call you friend, whenever the writers of the New Testament began their letters, None of them began Paul, a friend of Jesus, Peter, a friend of Jesus, Jude, a friend of Jesus, John, a friend of... None of them began it that way. Do you know how they began their letters? Listen, you're going to see these up on the screen. Look at this. Romans chapter 1, verse 1. Paul, a what? Okay, now let me, let's back up a little bit. You see the word servant. One of the things that we need to realize is that when the New Testament and the Old Testament were written, they were written primarily in Hebrew, Old Testament, primarily Greek, New Testament, with some Aramaic scattered throughout. Uh, when you look at the original language, you realize that the word for servant that we see in our translation is not what the word was in the original language. In the original language, the word that was used, the Greek word that was used, is the Greek word doulos. It never meant servant. It always meant slave. What's the difference? Well, a servant, you know, had their own, they were owned, but they owned themselves. They belonged to themselves, and they would go serve at this house, and maybe, you know, in the morning and then in the afternoon, they'd go serve at this house. But when they woke up, they didn't say, hey, what's my master want me to do? They woke up with their own desires and their own uh, goals and their own ambitions, that's not the word that's used here. The word slave speaks of someone who is owned, someone who belongs to someone else. And when they wake up, they don't say, what do I want to do today? A slave says, what does my master want me to do today? This is the word that Paul used to introduce himself. If you've got a New Living Translation, it says slave. That is an accurate translation. I think that the translators of the English text did not choose slave because of the nuance that we as Americans have with slavery in our past. Doesn't change the fact that when Paul introduced himself to the church at Rome, he said, Paul, a slave of Christ Jesus. Then he wrote to the church at Philippi, Philippians chapter 1, verse 1. Paul and Timothy, slaves 
of Christ Jesus. The word is doulos, it's slave. He said, I am a slave. Paul and Timothy, we are slaves of Jesus Christ. Listen, as he wrote to preacher boy Titus, Titus chapter 1, verse 1, Paul, a doulos, a slave of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ. James chapter 1, verse 1, James, a Greek word doulos, means slave. James, a slave of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 1, Simon Peter, a slave and an apostle of Jesus Christ. It's the word doulos, it means slave. Jude, verse 1, Jude, a slave of Jesus Christ and a brother of James. And then finally, Revelation chapter 1, verse 1, the revelation of Jesus Christ that God gave him to show his slaves what must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his slave, John. Even though Jesus looked at his disciples and said, I no longer call you slaves, I call you friends, there has got to be something wonderful about being a slave of Jesus that these guys understood that maybe we don't know. So let's dig into that this morning. This morning I want us to look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19 and 20. I'm going to base the, the two points uh, that uh, we're going to look at this morning out of this text and then draw a few principles out of it. Okay? So 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19 and 20. Don't you know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God? You are not your own. You're bought at a price. Ooh, that's slave talk. You're not your own. You were bought at a price. So glorify God with your body. So let's dig into this text. And first, I want us to see, I want us to ask the question, what are the benefits of being a slave of Jesus? What are the benefits? There are a multitude of benefits. Let me give you two. What are the benefits of being Jesus' slave? Number one, our worth is established. Our worth is established. Look back at our text. Don't you know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God? You're not your own. Here it is. You were bought at a price. You were bought at a price. Friend, if you were saved, if you are saved, you were bought at a price. This is true of you. So, let's talk about this for a minute. Let's say that I have something in my hand right now. Something in my hand. You don't know what it is. I have something in my hand. And let's say that I bought this right here for a quarter. And I'm asking you, would you like to come and see what's in my hand that I bought for a quarter? You probably would say, you bought it for a quarter, it's not worth me getting out of my seat. Uh, no, thank you. I'm not interested. I'll stay in my seat. But then let's say, okay, I've now got something different in my hand. This was purchased at Christie's in Geneva in May 2016 for $50.6 million dollars. Would you like to see it? Oh, all of a sudden, yes, yes. And I would say it's the open, the, the Oppenheimer Blue Diamond. It sold in May 2016 for $50.6 million. Now, if we didn't know about diamonds, we would look at it and say, it looks like a piece of glass. <laughs> what makes this valuable? What makes it valuable? What makes it more valuable than what somebody gave me a quarter for? The thing that gives it value is what is someone willing to pay for it. That's what gives it value. Simply put, how do you establish the value we were selling our house? How do you establish the value of a house? Well, we may say it's worth something, but it's really only worth what somebody's willing to pay for it. You, uh, de you determine what something is worth by what someone is willing to pay for it. Go back to our text. You are not your own, for you were bought at a price. So your value is established. There is something that was used to buy you at a price. So your value is established. What's your value? Well, what, who bought you and what were they willing to pay for you? Well, look at 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 18 and 19. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 18 and 19. Listen to this. For you know that you were redeemed or you were bought. You know that you were redeemed from your empty way of life, inherited from your fathers, 
not with perishable things like silver or gold, not with, you weren't bought with trivial things like silver and gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of an unblemished and spotless lamb. Let me go back and say the principle again. You determine something's value by what someone is willing to pay for it. You are not your own. You are bought with a price. If you're saved, who bought you? This says Jesus. If you're saved, Jesus redeemed you. Jesus bought you. What did he buy you with? A quarter? <laughs> he didn't buy you with trivial stuff like silver and gold, as valuable as we think those things are. What did he buy you with? He bought you with his life. God himself, Philippians 2 tells us, took on a body, took on flesh, humbled himself, becoming a man, humbled himself even to the point of the cross. And John 3.16 tells us that if we look at him and transfer our trust from self to him, trusting in him to make us right, you are saved, you were bought, and what's the price? God himself died for you. He bought you with his blood. Let me tell you, friend, that if somebody ever says, hey, how you feeling? And you say, I feel like a million bucks, you grossly underestimate your value. <laughs> You're worth infinitely more than a million bucks. Why? Because of the price Jesus paid for you. He gave himself. This is a wonderful truth. You're bought with a price. Okay, I've been bought. I'm Jesus' slave. But when we understand what that means, that means that I have infinitely more value than I ever thought I had. Being a slave of Jesus, if nothing else, if nothing but except for this, I realize being a slave of Jesus is wonderful. But it doesn't stop there. Let's keep going. Not only is our worth established, but our significance is established. Our significance is established. As slaves of God, as slaves of Jesus, our worth is there, but is there any substance to our worth? Is there any reason why such a high price is set upon us? Well, let's go to another principle. You determine the value of something by what inhabits it. It's one of the things, and I'll explain it this way. Whenever I started, uh, I finished up in seminary in Memphis. Uh, actually, I finished up in seminary in, in Louisville at the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary, but I began my seminary in Memphis uh, and when I went to the Mid-America Baptist Theological Seminary. And Memphis, if you've been there, is a huge, huge city. Me Me Memphis metro area has thousands upon thousands upon thousands upon thousands of houses. It is massive, lots of houses. But let me tell you, there's one house in Memphis, at least one house that I knew of, that people would come and visit from all over the United States, and they would even fly in from other countries to visit that house. Do you know what house that was? Graceland. Why was that house more valuable and something that people didn't fly in to see the place where I was staying, but they flew in to see that place? Why? Why? It was made of wood, you know, it was made of brick and made of some other things, just like every other house was. What made that house a thing of value? Elvis Presley lived there. Elvis Presley once lived there. And so people fly in to see this place and go to Graceland and converge south of Memphis. They're on the state line. They're in Whitehaven to see Graceland because Elvis Presley once lived there. It's who's it, who was in the house that gives the house value. Okay, so now let's talk about this. What gives you value? Well, first off, we see that our value comes from the price that was paid for us. God himself took on flesh and bought us with the, 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 the blood, with his blood there on the cross. But what inhabits us? Is there something inside of us or someone inside of us that gives us value? Let's go back to our text. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19. Don't you know that your body is a temple or a house or a dwelling place of what? The Holy Spirit who is in you. Ah, now we realize something else. Being a slave of Jesus is wonderful because it gives me value because I realize that Jesus bought me with his blood, so I have value. But not only that, I have significance because God himself and the person of the Holy Spirit has come to live within me. Come to live within me. On my own, I'm just dust. 
Whenever it comes time for me to, to, to walk through death's door and to die, it, un, unless they put, you know, what, with, it's not only the chemicals they put in you, you know, at the time of your death to, to lay out in front of everybody, but it's also the Diet Cokes we've been drinking, you know, all of our life that keep us preserved for a while. But uh, given enough time, I'm going to go back to dust. It's not our bodies that are valuable. It's who's in our body. Listen to what 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7 says. Now, we have this treasure in clay jars. What's the treasure? Well, in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, he had been talking about the gospel and all of the, the, the ramifications of the gospel. This gospel, the fact that Jesus died for us and we've trusted in him and all of the things that are true of us because we have trusted in the gospel, because we have trusted in Jesus. We have this treasure, what? In clay jars. We began with dust, going back to dust. So that this extraordinary power may be from God and not us. Friend, let me tell you that there are many preachers, many shysters, that would lead you to believe that you are a person of value simply because you are you. That is not biblical. You are valuable because God chose to place value on you and give the life of his son for you, and you are valuable because you are in Christ and he is in you. It really is Christ that has chosen to make you valuable. If your view of yourself causes you to think uh, proud thoughts, that's not, that's not a biblical view. If your view of yourself, uh, a view of your value and your worth, if that moves you to drop to your knees and say, thank you, Lord Jesus, it's, if there's anything good, it's because of you, then we're getting it, right? We're getting it. When we understand our value, it's not to inflate our egos. It is to inform our gratitude. So being slaves of Jesus... We see that we've been bought with an incredible price, and our significance lies in the fact that he's taken up residence with us. Friend, let me tell you, there are so many wonderful truths, but I'm not going to have time to, to do that this morning. I want to give you a let you know of a resource, a book that I have read a couple of times before. I will certainly read it many times before um, I... Uh, Close my eyes in death, given enough time. And it is this book. It is the book by John MacArthur, Slave, The Hidden Truth About Your Identity in Christ. If you want to know what the Bible says about you, the things that are true of you, because you have trusted in Jesus, because you are a slave of Jesus, I cannot recommend this biblical resource highly enough. Slave, The Hidden Truth About Your Identity in Christ. So the first is what are the benefits? Number two, and we'll finish with this. Number two, what are the requirements of being Jesus' slave? What's required of me? What, what am I to do? Look back at the text. Don't you know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, so we have value because of who resides inside of us? You're not your own. You're bought with a price. So we have value because of the price that was paid for us. So what's the requirement? What are we supposed to do? So glorify God with your body. Because of what Jesus has done for you, if you're saved, your job is simple. Glorify God in your body. Do you know what that means? When we glorify God, that doesn't mean that we add anything to him. We can't add to God's glory. God is already amazing and wonderful and perfect, perfect in every single way. There is nothing that we can add to him. Um, a, a Christian author named uh, John Piper once said that we understand glorifying God this way. He said that on a clear night sky, you can look up at the stars... And these stars seem so far away. You can see them, but they're just specks. They're just specks up there. But he said, what you can do is you can get a telescope. And I've enjoyed doing this. I've got a telescope at home, and I've absolutely enjoyed doing this. You can get a telescope, and you can aim it at one of those stars. And with your naked eye, you can see that star. It's so small. But then you look in that telescope, and it's a lot bigger. Now, let me ask you a question. Did the star change size? No, it didn't. What happened is, is I was able to view it differently. That's what he says glorifying God means. It changes God in no way. It's a way in which we're able to come into a greater understanding of who God is. So what's it mean for you and I to glorify God? 
It means that your talk demonstrates that you serve God and that you love him and that he's real and that he's a good God. Your actions demonstrate to others that you serve God, that you love him, that he's real, and that he's a good God. It is our actions and our words that allow those who watch us to affect how it is that they see God. Let me tell you that whenever you go to work or go to school or wherever else it is that you go, you don't even have to say that you're a Christian. Many times people already know what we claim. They hear that, you know, we've been to church or something like that. And let me tell you, they're watching you. Unbelievers are watching you. And if they know that you claim to be a follower of Jesus, and as they look at you, they see a person of integrity, and they see a person who loves, and they see a person who forgives, and they see a person who, uh, whenever they are called to do a job, you can count on it, they're going to get that job done. They are a person who, in every way, is demonstrating the good things. And whenever they fail, and whenever, whenever you fail and you falter, you own it, and you confess it, you make it right. When they see you, and they associate you as someone who's following the Lord, let me tell you, that directly impacts how they see God. The opposite is also true. If they know you to be a person that claims a relationship with the Lord... But you're all too familiar with the dirty movies and the dirty music that uh, you know, media is pumping out. And they know that uh, you are someone who gossips and slanders, and you're someone who doesn't forgive, and you're someone who uh, does all sorts of things. That is not going to only affect th their view of you. That's going to affect their view of the God that you claim that you serve. If that's what God does, I don't need him. When it claims, when the Bible says glorify God in your body, it is saying live in such a way that others see Jesus in you and are attracted to him. And are attracted to him. How does that happen? Well, it's very simple. Let's go back to the slave analogy. It's very simple. How do we glorify God? How do we live that way? In fact, how do we know how to live? How, how do we know what those things are? How do we know what to say and what not to say? How do we know what to do and what not to do? What, what is that? Let's go back to the slave analogy. If you are a slave, when you wake up in the mornings, you don't think, what do I want to do today? Do you know what you do? You wake up and say, what does my master want me to do? Your responsibilities are very simple. You know what the responsibility is? If you lumped it under everything, you know what that one word would be? Obedience. That's it. Master says to do it. I'm a slave. I'm to do what the master says. It's obedience. If you put everything under, everything that we're required to do under one word, it would be since I am a slave of Christ, I have been called to do what the master has told me to do. It is obedience. And let me tell you, the word obedience shows up tons of times in the Old and New Testament. Tons of times. Let me give you three. Two of them came right out of Jesus' mouth. John chapter 14, verse 15. John 14, 15 says, if you love me, Jesus says, if you love me, if you have relationship with me, if you are a follower of me, what will you do? You will keep my commands. Jesus said, do you love me? Then do what I tell you to do. It's that simple. That's what slaves do. It's obedience. Jesus, you've said to do this, then as a slave, then I will do it. I will obey. Jesus said, if you love me, do what I tell you to do. Keep my commands. He said it in the very next chapter. You are my friends if what? If you do what I command you. You say you're a friend of me, Jesus asked. You say you're a friend of me? Then do what I tell you to do. It's obedience. Listen to John as he wrote 2 John chapter 1, verse 6. This is love that we walk according to his commands. These are only three places of the multitude of places that I could have picked from in Scripture that tell us that our primary duty is obedience. You know what that means? We have got to be spending time on God's Word. Friend, I'm telling you, you can't make up the rules as you go. If you're making up the rules as you go and you're not listening to the Master, then you don't know what he's telling you to do, and your life is not characterized by obedience. Do you want to be someone who loves Jesus and expresses that love to him and does the thing that slaves do? You obey him, then you have got to be in his word. You've got to read it. You've got to read it. And further, your answer needs to always be yes. 
In fact, whenever you come into your time in God's Word, ideally in the morning, before you even uh, get into God's Word, your heart needs to already be saying yes. Your heart needs to already be saying, Lord, before I even see what you're going to tell me that I need to do, and maybe I'm going to see something that tells me that I need to think a certain way and I'm not thinking that, then Lord, already my answer is yes before I even know what you're going to tell me to do. Or Lord, maybe there's some behaviors that are going on in my heart and in my life And I'm going to read something in your scripture today that tells me that what I'm doing is wrong and I'm going to need to change. Lord Jesus, before I even read that, my answer is yes. That's the heart of a slave. Obedience. Getting into God's word, putting it into practice. But let me end by saying this. Slaves of human masters have to obey. They obey because they must. They have no choice. Friend, let me tell you, if you're saved, you know why you serve Jesus? Because you want to. Because you want to. When we come to realize all that Jesus has done for us, we find within our heart not the notion that, oh, I've got to do what Jesus told me to do. I feel guilty if I don't. No, we will find our heart drawing us into relationship with him, the Holy Spirit calling out, ah, my Father, calling us in relationship with him, and we want to do the things that he has said because of, he's so good to us. And our heart is filled with gratitude because you have done this for me, Jesus. I want to serve you. I want to live for you. Jesus has made so many precious promises to us. He's purchased us with his blood. He's filled us with his Holy Spirit. He's prepared our eternal home for us. He'll share the joys of heaven with us, making us co-heirs and so much more. And so we don't obey out of obligation. We obey because we want to. We want to. In fact, it is quite possible that if we come to more and more understand this relationship with Jesus that we'll become more like the writers of Scripture. That when we could be saying, I'm a friend of Jesus, we will say, I'm a slave of Jesus Christ. Proudly wear that. Let me give you one more Scripture as we close. Matthew chapter 6, verse 24. Matthew chapter 6, verse 24. I've got this on the screen for you. You can write this down. In the translation that I have, the Christian Standard Bible, it says this, No one can serve two masters, since either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Okay, so in this sermon, the last 30 minutes or so, as I've been spending time with you, you have realized that a lot of times whenever we see the word serve, not every time, but most of the, many of the times that we see the word serve in our English translations, It's probably the word slave. They just didn't translate it that way. Well, you guessed right regarding this one. These are the words for slave. Listen to what Jesus really said. No one can do the work of a slave or be the slave of two masters. Jesus said, you're going to have to pick sides. You can't serve both. You can't be a slave of both. Since either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You have to choose who will be your master. You cannot have two masters. You cannot be a slave to both God and money. Jesus said, make your choice. Make your choice. And even as I was looking over that... My mind was drawn back to Joshua chapter 24, verse 15, when Joshua was coming to the end of his life. And you know, many of you know this passage. And Joshua looked at the people of Israel and called them into relationship with the Lord. Essentially, he drew a line in the sand as he was about to depart, as he was about to leave. And he said that, uh, you know, as uh, you need to choose this day who you will serve. You need to make a choice today who you will serve. He was drawing a line in the sand as he was about to leave them. You need to make a choice as to who you will serve. And then he said, as for me and my family, as for me and my house, we're serving the Lord. This is a wonderful, liberating truth. If we grasp this truth, life takes on purpose. It takes on meaning. It gives you value. All of a sudden, you see sin as appalling as it is for the the, the appalling nature that it is, and you find your heart wanting to confess it quickly and get it over with so that you can get back into relationship with Jesus. All of a sudden, this Christian life comes alive when we understand this principle. 
So where do you stand this morning? Which side of the line are you on? Are you trying to straddle both? Jesus and Joshua said, you can't do both. You have to pick sides. This morning, as I close this in prayer and as we go into our time of response, I'm going to ask you to determine which side you're on. And if you're straddling, and during the time that I pray, I'm going to ask you that if your heart is not right, to spend time asking the Lord to forgive you and pick that one foot up and stand firmly on the side of recognizing that you are honored to be a slave of Jesus. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we come to you and we thank you that you are so good to us. You're so good to us. And you are, you would have been completely just and righteous and holy and pure and all of these words and more. You would have continued to maintain those things if as you looked down from heaven, you saw us Rebels, lawbreakers, breaking your laws, refusing to comply to your authority over our life, or trying to live a duplicitous life. You would have been just and righteous to condemn us all to a place in hell. But you're also a God of love and grace and forgiveness and patience. And you stepped out of heaven, stepped temporarily off your throne, humbled yourself by taking on the body of a man, lived the perfect life, and then died on the cross and rose from the dead to give forgiveness and to buy anyone who will put their faith and trust in you. Father, I pray right now for anyone who has never put their faith and trust in you, Jesus. I pray right now that they would transfer their trust. They would stop trusting in themselves to make themselves right in your eyes, that they would realize their guilt before you, and they would fall at the foot of the cross and ask Jesus to save them. Father, I also pray for those who know that they're saved, but they've been straddling the fence, trying to serve you and um, live for the lust of the, pleasure, lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Father, I pray right now, even in this moment, that there are many that are asking forgiveness and resolving in the power of your Holy Spirit to see themselves as an honored slave of Jesus and all that that means and to live a life of obedience to you. And one day, Jesus, hear you tell them, well done, good and faithful slave. Father, I pray right now as we go into this time of response, however it is that you're leading us, I pray right now that we would make those adjustments. We want to be right with you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's all stand.